You need more and more empathetic leaders everywhere who are here to serve. Leadership is not a position of authority. Leadership is a position of service to enable people who work with us to deliver to their potential. Hello, my name is Pranav Kothari. I work at Educational Initiatives. A lot of our work is improving learning outcomes in school through the field of assessments and personalized learning. I'm so excited to have Aditya Nataraj on this conversation today. Thank you so much for coming, Aditya. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you for Thank having you. me here, Pranav. So, you know, seven and a half years ago, uh, when I first met you, when I was very raw, very green, and just had an aspiration to join the education sector, and you asked me this you know, million dollar question, what is your private dream for a public good? So Aditya, what is your private dream for a public good? So the model of leadership on which we work was shared by uh, Mr. Nitin Noria, uh, who was, was the Dean of Harvard Business School now. And his distillation of leadership is leadership is the courage to convert a private dream into a public reality. And I really find this extremely powerful. Uh, because it has three, four important words. First, it's a private dream, right? So there's something that each of us intrinsically think is wrong with the world, right? And that's very intrinsic motivation. It's not about opportunity, you know, it's not uh, nothing like that. It's just something that really irritates the hell out of you. So it's something very deeply private. It comes from your personal circumstances in life. I get very irritated by environmental issues. I get very irritated by women issues. I get very irritated by the fact that there's economic inequality. That's something very personal. So the first step is to first identify what is this private dream which is irritating you, right? Second is to act on it, which is the courage to convert the private dream, right? Now, this problem, I mean, it's very nice to talk with a bunch of friends over a drink at 8 o'clock in the evening, but tomorrow morning, if you don't go back and you don't build your life around trying to solve this problem, what are you here for, right? Uh, the beauty of human existence is the fact that we have choice over what we can do. And how do we apply that choice to be useful to ourselves, to be happy ourselves, and the world is happier. So the courage to follow that, the conviction to follow that, no matter what consequences it has. So there's no point going into a traditional job and saying, boss, I'm bored. Yeah, you're bored. Then have the courage to do what you really care about. I kuch karna tha, lekin. You're only 25, yeah? Karo na. <laughs> Who's stopping you except your own mind? Right? Parents could have stopped you at 14 or whatever. So second one is courage, right? And so courage to convert a private dream into a public reality and the into public reality is where the skills are involved right this requires i'm a great believer in that in inch wide and mile deep i think each of us needs to develop very deep skills in whatever we want to transform um, civic action is you know the days of the traditional ngo where you know you wore a jola and you went to a village and said to saal se in logon ke saath kaam kar raho. i think that's over uh, I think that was a very useful post-independence Gandhian phase. Uh, and I think we have to transition from that because we're realizing how deep some of these issues are, right? Whether you take gender, the amount of depth you need, agricultural improvement, whether you take education, livelihoods, health, each of these is an extremely deep area. And even within education, I mean, I can tell you 12, I mean, like just understanding why science should be taught, how it should be taught, you know, you can spend your life on. So, so deep expertise, how do we develop uh, deep expertise in something? So this was a framework by which, I mean, if I was encouraging Gandhi fellows to do this, I had to do the same thing as well, right? So, uh, so, this, so for me, the, the private dream is that uh, my maid's daughter has the same quality of education as my daughter. And today, I see that difference widening more and more. Okay. 
uh, well, I mean, in, in my father's generation, my father went to a government school and then if at all, you know, his, uh, uh, after some time he got into a private school, which was not substantially worse than the government school because government schools were reasonably good and, uh, you know, private schools were only marginally better. But today, the quality of the government school is probably still as where it was some time ago and my daughter goes to an IB school. So the standard deviation is just getting wider and wider, which means now if I tell my maid's daughter, work hard, she says, why? I'm never going to get the opportunity to break the 10,000 rupee income per month level. And that's true. But if I could, as a democracy, say every child gets a shot, you know, irrespective of parental income, right? And we provide the same quality up to there. Then after that, how hard you work is left to you. Uh, that would be a country which I think I'd be really proud of. And uh, so what am I doing to contribute towards that? Uh, is the question I ask myself and I think because of my previous corporate background, I used to be a consultant. I worked in helping a pharma factory turn around and improve profitability and improve sales and turnover. I worked in a, in a auto uh, uh, a factory helping them turn around sales, improve throughput and stuff like that. And I said, hey, can I apply those same set of skills to actually doing it in the education sector? Right? Because it's the same, the principle is the same. Large systems all get complicated and you need to organize people and process so that they actually achieve better outcomes. Um, so that's, so my whole thing is how do I, within the next generation or two, how do we set up systems so that the bottom quartile of India's population is able to get very low standard deviation difference in education quality from the top quartile. Um, and I think that would be the most exciting thing to do. You know, tell me what is Kaivalya and what does it aspire to do for India and the world? So Kaivalya is a change management organization. We believe that in order to make government systems and government schools work, we need to improve people and process inside government. And so we basically help governments make their systems more agile. Almost if you imagine that, you know, when uh, State Bank of India needed to move to being competing with ICICI Bank, what do you need to do? We think that's the sort of situation today in government schools. Private schools have moved forward, but government systems are still stuck in the 1960s uh, and don't leverage technology, process and talent enough. And we support governments to improve the quality of their schools by improving that. And approximately how many you know, schools, officials, geographies has Kevildia already reached? So we work across 14 states at the moment um, and we work across three different programs. Uh, at the state level, we call it the State Transformation Program, where we work with the top three to 500 people at the state level in a leadership development mode over three to four years to help them improve their systems for managing talent, process, technology. And then we also work with about 30 districts uh, across 10 states. Uh, where we call it the district transformation program and there we work with the top 150 people at the district level to help them jointly set a vision for the district, evolve a strategy, design a change management process and actually do change so that finally schools and results change. And finally the third program is a school transformation program where we work with about a thousand schools across uh, I think about six states where we work with principals, teachers, and the related communities to help them evolve a strategy, vision, change management plan, and execute. So across the board, the principle is similar. It's leadership development, uh, whether it's at the state, district, or at the school level. And we work with about, I think, 10,000 people uh, between those three programs. You know, how did Kaivalya start? Uh, what was the initial journey? Who were the supporters? So we actually started with a very simple vision. Uh, what we noticed is that while most people believe, so we, if you want equity in education, right? If you want my daughter's, if you want my maid's daughter to have as much of a chance as my daughter in life, we believe you have to improve government schools because the bottom quartile of India is still going to government schools. Uh, these are the people who are below $2 income, they're still going to government schools. So we need to do something about that. And while most people believe that government school teachers are, you know, unionized, not working, 
unintelligent, uncommitted. Uh, our experience was completely different. So we realized that it is just a question of the leadership that you provide people. The same person uh, today, if I'm if I move to Singapore, I don't spit on the road. I drive properly. And if I'm in India, I you know, and if I'm in Delhi especially, I end up you know driving even more rashly. So the circumstances in which you operate influence your behavior. And we feel that inside government schools, the type of leadership and the processes that exist are causing teachers to do this. I'm not denying that there's a 10, 15 percent who will probably even in Singapore drive rashly and similarly inside government school also um, misbehave. But there's a large percentage of people who's influenced by the leadership and the processes within uh, the government. And so our whole thesis was how do you shift the leadership to become much more, you know, almost agile. Governments are still stuck. We're still using the same systems that the British left behind, right, in education. It's still called Sarkar, which is what you call the British. You still have, you know, the four most common words used in education administration are inspection, monitoring, suspension and transfer in a world in which you're talking about children's enablement. So the same words which are used to the employee in government will be the words that she uses to the child. If the teacher is going to be inspected, monitored, transferred or suspended, that's what she does to the child. Right. So if you need to transform the culture within government, uh, that was a very critical portion. If you transform the culture, so almost look at how do we transform the culture within government to become almost agile, people-centric, employee. I mean, if government started having a thing on, you know, best places to work, I wonder how many, what sort of score you'd get. But that's our aspiration, to create the best place to work, because only then when the teacher in the last government school is happy, is she going to be able to make the children happy. So that was the, that was a big, hairy, audacious goal. Right? And even the largest organizations in India, like TCS, for example, has 400,000 people. The government has 12 million employees just in education. Wow, that's massive. Right? So no one knows how to set up systems. And TCS, when it has 400,000 employees, may have 100 points at which these employees are located. Right. Right? Government has 1.2 million points at which the service is rendered. So how do you design HR systems to support that last mile teacher who's sitting in a village in Uttarakhand, uh, in a place where, you know, she's, uh, there's snowfall, she's going to be cut off for four months from the rest of civilization and she still stays motivated, uh, is a completely different problem. So that's where we started from, saying if we keep the employees motivated, if we keep them connected, if we keep them learning, children will automatically start learning. So that's sort of where we started from. So I think there are different images evoke in our mind when we think of the word leader, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the corporate sector, it's a certain stereotype. In the government sector, politician, different styles. What is Cavalier's leadership model? Very interesting question. So actually, we looked at it when the first time we were considering launching a leadership program for principals. We thought that the rest of the world would have cracked this. So we went to Singapore, Korea, US, Netherlands, UK to look at what models different people were using for training principles. Interestingly, we were really disappointed. Um, either there's a very simplistic corporate model, right, where you subject them to, subject teachers who are potential leaders to some sort of thing on strategy, marketing, finance, stuff like that, which is great exposure, but doesn't help her tomorrow morning in the school. Or you have ed schools running this, which means you teach the history of American education, purpose of education, this, that. Our experience when we spoke to government schools and saying, what type of issues are you actually having when we spoke to principals of schools? They are having issues on four dimensions. One, they don't know how to build their teams. There's always one out of the four people in their four or five people who are their teachers. There's one teacher who's you know, highly demotivated, uh, doesn't want to come to school, doesn't want to do this thing. There's one who's over enthusiastic and over moralistic, not able to get the others. There's a third one who doesn't believe in her own capability uh, and therefore is very timid. There's a fourth one who doesn't want to try any innovation, is stuck in the 1960s. What do you do for these sort of people? So one is an issue with how do you build teams, how do you build people, right? And this is not taught in this context. It's taught in a corporate context about how to manage people, but how do you manage teachers? What are their drivers? What are their capabilities? What are their skills? How do you coach them? This is not taught at all, right? So one is people leadership. The second one is instructional leadership, right? Uh, so we call it the PIOS model, people, uh, instruction, organization, and social. So in the instructional leadership, again, the biggest problem that principals have is when a child is not learning, you can see that a particular child is 
you know, not passing, you don't know what instruction to give the teacher as to how she should instruct the child. What is the feedback to give to the teacher? Wohi wapas padhao, teen bar padhao, that is a very simplistic way. Lekin ye bachcha kyun? Matlab chaar bar hamne usko padhaya, abhi tak fractions he is not getting properly. There is something wrong here, right? Right. So we are not able to give the, the principal is not able to add value to the teacher. So therefore the teacher starts thinking, okay, you are just an administrative head, you are not really helping me in my delivery of my goal, which is value to children. Right. right? The third one is organizational. There is a whole lot, I mean a school is like a small business, right? An average school has 8 to 12 teachers. Uh, you have a bunch of customers because those 12 teachers are servicing 240 children and therefore 240 parents. Uh, there has to be a vision, there has to be a budget, there has to be a strategy, there has to be goals, there have to be metrics, there are some things that you are achieving, there is a board which is your school management committee. These are not the things that a typical principal knows how to manage. Right. She was teaching physics yesterday and just because she's the senior most teacher, she's suddenly been made principal of a school. Right. And so she really doesn't know how to handle these roles. So again, how do you just help her uh, get control over that? And the fourth and probably the most important is the social angle, the S. How do you engage with parents? Every parent has a view on what she wants for her child. Positive, negative, no judgment here. But you know, mere bachche ko bahut padha, aur homework de do. Hmm. But the education will tell you that you know, homework nahi dena chahiye. Nahi, usko thoda maro. And the educationist will tell you, usko maro nahi. So there's a huge parent engagement, community engagement. Ye bachchi hai, isko kya padhana? Right? So, you know, there's a gender bias. All these issues that I as a principal have to stand up for. I'm hmm. really as a principal, I'm a social reformer in that village. Hmm. Right? The average principal becomes principal in India at about the age of 47, which means till the age of 60, he's got 13 years. He can see an entire generation through that school. Right. Right? And so if he changed the views on caste, gender, religion, uh, and he just set a new paradigm of inclusiveness, that whole generation would look at it differently. Right. So how our leadership model basically covers these four angles. How do you teach them to manage people better, do coaching of their teachers better, do the organization structure, uh, values, strategy, stuff like that better, and fourth, how do you engage the community better. So that's what ours covers. So it's like, I mean, think of an exec management program, uh, which would go for IM, but customized for schools and run over four years. Got it. That's what it would be. I think when we're, you know, talking about uh, teachers or even individuals within Kevilia hmm. to be more empathetic, hmm. uh, to listen, um, organizationally to do this for thousands of people is very difficult, right? Mm. I mean, what has been, how have you instituted this culture? So even if you are sitting here in Delhi, you know, one of your Cavalier fellows in remote parts of Assam is having the same sort of gravity of listening, of understanding, of recognizing sort of the different things that has happened in the teachers, the principal's life. Uh, I mean, because it's harder to replicate this DNA, right? It's much easier when you have made a Maruti car and you're making millions of them because your robots are sort of churning that out. Yeah. It's far more difficult from a human replication perspective. Uh, you're right, Pranav. It's definitely the analogy of an OEM and cars is probably less applicable. But the analogy of a professional services firm mm. is probably more applicable, sure. right? The KPMGs, PWCs, Deloitte's all have an excess of 100,000 Accentures, have an excess of 100,000 people. They've got no customized product. They're going into a particular context. They've got some principles. They've got some ways of working. They've got some tools. And then there's a particular context in which you have to apply that and achieve quality. Right? So they have done it with hundreds of thousands of people. Right. Look at the caliber of work that McKinsey does across the world. Right. No one is saying in the past you used to imagine that that is possible with five people in a local thing in Delhi. But now McKinsey has actually managed to scale that and provide even better service than if you were just a small firm. Right? That's right. Because learnings from one country are applicable to exactly. the other. So the from one is, practice is applicable to the other. Yeah. Exactly. So how do you organize yourself by practice? Hmm. Like in a professional service firm. Hmm. Right? So there are two groups. One is a practice which is developing a skill. And another is a client servicing group who is applying from multiple practices to a particular client. So let's assume you have a group who's working in Uttarakhand district. Right? They're not going to know everything about social emotional learning or about science or about coaching or facilitation or anything. But if there are practices inside the firm, inside Kaivalya, who know each of these areas, 
and they can access, the Uttarakhand team can access this in order to serve their client and they know which combination. So this is the mass customization as an organization, right? Because you have a group of 100 projects that we are running who are allowed to do whatever is required for their client and then you have a group of 40 centers of excellence who have different, different skills and who are learning from these various areas and they're synthesizing and creating products. Right? And these 100 projects decide which of these 40 they want to use, when they want to use, which government officer wants to do that, why they want to do that, and then there is this exchange. So you're not forcing the same solution for a 2,500 children's school in urban Bombay as you are for a Jharkhand, you know, 20-person school, Maoist infected. Because the solutions going to be required are different. So this customization, depending on, okay, so here there's no need for coaching and building a team because it's a single teacher in Jharkhand, right? So what is a team? There's not an issue. But there is conflict in this area. So social emotional learning is going to be very different. Building the school community is going to be very different. Bombay is a high pressured life. So the solutions are going to be different. So I think the question is, so I think the model that we look at is like a partnership firm, large scale professional services firm. Uh, in which each of us is responsible for a particular geography or a particular practice. And that might help you get your mind around how you can scale without uh, losing quality. How does uh, what Cavalier do ultimately lead to student learning outcomes increasing? Okay. So the first job when you're taught in corporate is how to improve profitability and market value. right? But the whole paradigm in education is never, I mean, we don't know what the final purpose is. We get caught in a lot of complicated vocabulary. But bottom line, if you don't add value to children and if their learning doesn't improve, they don't become better citizens, if they don't become more collaborative, if they don't feel value, then you failed as a principal of a school. So the starting point of all our leadership programs is first doing an assessment right, of where are children today and using that assessment not as a way to mark children but to mark how well we have done as adults in serving children. And this is a complete paradigm shift because today when the child gets 40%, the teacher doesn't get rebuked. It is a child who gets one thappar saying, padha nahi thik se, right? But I padhaya nahi thik se, that is where the conversation needs to shift. Isko to interest nahi wo buddhu bahar dekhta rehta hai. Mene interest nahi karwaya, hmm. right? And isi wo bahar dekh raha hai. So how do you get the adults into a reflective mode by looking at the results that children are not engaged, children are not working hard, ye to kaam hi nahi karta hai. I can't do my work with it. So all our work is to getting leaders into these reflective modes, look at the results and say, do you agree that every child has potential? Right? And do you agree that you are the tool through which that potential is going to be unleashed? Are you doing the best to do that? Do you need more skills to do this? And so everything is built around how do you improve children, the actualization of potential in children, measured by, to a certain extent, learning outcomes and behavioral outcomes. And this is gold. I mean, I think corporate leaders would die to sort of, you know, create a culture where people are reflecting that and holding themselves accountable that the outcomes were not achieved and what are the skills that they need to do. Mm. I mean, I see a lot of lessons that can be transferred from here to the corporate sector as well. Sure, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need more and more empathetic leaders everywhere who are here to serve. Leadership is not a position of authority. Leadership is a position of service to enable people who work with us to deliver to their potential. Only then will they deliver to the final um, client, whether it's a child or in the corporate world, a, cus a customer. Absolutely. Given this ambitious dream of you know, having the bottom quartile of India's education um, customers, the children who are going there, have access to the same opportunities as the top quartile. How is Cavalier planning to scale? Uh, what, are, what is the rationale behind that? What are the principles that you're espousing? How are you thinking about scale? What's your definition of scale? What's the targets that you have in that? So, honestly, people think we have scaled, but I think that's quite a sad story because our goals are so low uh, that as a result, people think we are an aspirational organization to be. But let me just give you an example, right? Um, the education sector spends about uh, 12 lakh crores in India. Okay, 12 lakh crores across all state governments and all put together. Now, if an NGO is, all as NGOs put together, 
you know, whether we are 20 crores, 30 crores, whatever, 12 lakh crores and 12 million employees, right? All the education NGOs put together will not even count to 1% of that, right? It's highly unlikely that we even add up to 1% of that. So if we accept that we are not going to grow much bigger as a sector, we are not going to be 50% the size of the number of 12 million teachers, right? We are not going to be 6 million people in the NGO sector adding value to 12 million teachers. So we are going to be about the same size we are now, or maybe two or three times this, one or two or three percent. So I think that requires us to rewire saying, how does one percent, how can we as a one percent cause a 10 percent delta in outcomes, right? Because we are only one percent of people. 1% of budgets, but can we cause a 10% delta or even a 20% delta? Or if you are 2%, how do we cause a 40%, 50% delta? Right. Once you use that as a framework for thinking of this, that we are going to be always small compared to the size of government and government's resources, how do we make this happen? Uh, and then within that 1%, as an organization, we are not even 1%. So really, I think as a sector, we need to rethink what is scale. Bangladesh alone, has more than five NGOs I know of, which are more than 1,000 crores each. Wow, Bangladesh. Yes. And India doesn't have even one educational NGO which is at that size. Um, so and all of India put together. Like, is, there's not even one NGO that not has that I know of which is 1,000 crores, as far as I know. Um, now, people argue that in Bangladesh, because the government doesn't work, that's why NGOs have to be big and stuff like that. But in India also, several governments are not working. Right? And we have so much more economic wealth in there. So somewhere we've got stock, stuck in a paradigm of you know, sub-excellence compared to it. And I'm not saying that scale is a sign of excellence. But for me, scale provides you the resources to go deep into issues. Right? If I'm working in 20 villages, I see only X number of autistic children. Right? If I'm working in 50 villages, I see only X amount of fraction teaching. And I don't understand the problems. Just being things on scale just enables you to understand patterns which are very valuable. So scale is an opportunity. Most people define it as when you scale up, your quality goes down. I believe that when you scale up, if you design well, your quality goes up because you see patterns in data, hmm. which then you can specialize in. So therefore, to that extent, we are still a small organization. So I think the other analogy I find very useful is sort of like cars. Right? When you're producing, if you take Maruti, for example, the only reason Maruti is able to produce an outstanding quality car or a Mercedes-Benz is able to produce a car or a Toyota is because they don't do everything internally. Right? They have original equipment manufacturers, OEMs. Someone has specialized for the last 20 years in producing just wiper systems. Someone has produced in brake systems. Someone has specialized in fuel injection systems. Someone has specialized you know, in, in car interiors. Someone has specialized just in the inject... You know, so they just specialize, 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 and Maruti's job is to put that together and then provide a range of models for the customer, right? All the way from a, you know, from two and a half lakh customer to a 25 lakh customer. But you are sourcing from various people. So this OEM model, I think, is the model for scaling. I think these coalitions are very important. I don't think it's going to be possible. Whereas what we have done traditionally as NGOs is, Acha, I'm in school, I'm working in school, i Chalo, chhati sathvi kabhi mein hi kar lunga. But yeah. chhati sathvi is very, very difficult to teach. Science kabhi mein hi kar lunga. Social science kabhi mein hi kar lunga. Systems and process bhi mein hi kar lunga. Leadership bhi mein hi kar lunga. Community mobilization bhi mein hi kar lunga. You know, teacher development bhi mein hi kar lunga. Technology mein development bhi mein hi kar lunga. But each of these is a specialized area just like the fuel injection equipment, just like, uh, you know, the wiper system or just like the wheel system or the axle system. And I think the more we are as an as a sector able to organize ourselves to specialize very, very deeply and then integrate ourselves in order to then be able to provide a service uh, to a set of government schools, I think the more and more chances are that we'll be able to accelerate. But that requires all of us to reorganize the way we are. So when I'm talking about scale, like Maruti as a whole, you know, the final car that's being sold at two and a half lakhs, it's not that it produced everything for the two and a half lakhs. Probably 25,000 or 50,000 of that is the value added by Maruti. Right. right? But otherwise, it's buying most of the equipment internally. Now, can you partner similarly in the education sector saying, okay, when I'm trying to solve secondary education, right? I work with the best people who understand science education. I work with the best people who understand entrepreneurship education. I work with the best people who understand sports education. And work with the best people who understand arts and drama education. And bringing that together uh, in order to deliver value. I, 
people, the best people who understand language education, right? How do you bring all this together and therefore deliver value to the client? So I think scale needs to be remodeled in our minds as to how scale can actually help uh, create greater value. There are 12 million teachers in the Indian education system. How will we achieve this transformation at this large scale? I know it can seem daunting at times, but uh, honestly, I don't think the, at least the way we look at it is not to get overwhelmed by the 12 million, uh, but look at it from a district point of view, right? A district has, there are 600 districts in the country and each of them has about 20,000 teachers, right? Plus or minus 5,000, let's assume. So that's how the 12 million comes, 600 into 20,000. Now, for those 20,000 teachers, and they are typically in about 1,000 to 2,000 schools in a district. So, for that 20,000, there are about 150 leaders at the district level. These are called cluster resource coordinators, block resource coordinators, district education officers, right? So, every group of 10, 15 schools becomes a cluster, every group of 10, 15 clusters becomes a block, uh, and 10 blocks becomes a district. So, about 100 cluster resource coordinators, another 20 block resource coordinators and district education office is about 150 people. We focus on these 150 people to try and improve the capability of the 20,000 because this is the crux. You can directly go and train teachers by yourself, but if this system doesn't learn how to train teachers, what teachers issues are, how to design curriculum for teacher development, how to support teachers in practice, how if this system doesn't learn it, then whatever you do is going to be useless, right? So we focus on this 150. Uh, and this is what we do across 30 districts in the country, focusing on these 150 people approximately in each of these districts. Now, these 150 people, multiple things need to be done, but broadly I'd classify them into two groups, right? There's HR related processes, Right? And then there is technology and technology data and process efficiency that can be brought. So there's a people bucket and there's a process bucket. So in the people bucket, for example, would you believe that for these 150 people, like inside a company, if you had 20,000 employees, this is not a small company, this is just a district in the country, right? 20,000 employees. What would be the caliber of the leadership that you'd have of the top 150 people? Would be pretty high, right? You'd at yes. least have selection processes for that. Yes. Would you believe that the district education officer, who's the number one person, is automatically in some states in the country, the senior most principal of a secondary school automatically becomes a district education officer? Which means one day I was handling a secondary school with 1,200 children, kg to 12, two sections each. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to handle, I'm 59 years old, before I retire at 60, six months before my retirement, I'm going to become the head of the district and handle 2,000 schools. Oh. With no training, no selection, not even like an intent that I would like to do this. No. Nothing of that. Sort. This is just automatic, right? Now, this was set up at a time when seniority-based was the right thing to do and stuff like that. Similarly, who gets selected as a cluster resource coordinator? Ideally, you want the most motivated. The beautiful thing about 20,000 people is, if you just take in 20,000, I mean, anyone would bet that the top 1% must be committed, motivated, intelligent, capable. Just 1%, right? That's 200 people. What would happen if we just found the top 1% and made them the leaders? We need only 150 positions, right? Right. And that is a lot of the work that we do. We say, let's find the 1% of teachers who are already motivated, already energized, already capable, already critical thinkers. And there is, I mean, I think there's about 8 to 12% like that. And the 1% is very easy to find. So the first thing we do, go in and we say is, okay, first let's reselect a lot of this kind of, because a lot of people just came by seniority. They didn't know why they came into those roles. The roles are not defined. So we actually help write JDs for these roles, job descriptions, KRAs for these roles. And we pass new orders inside government as to what this role actually involves. Then we start reselecting for these roles. We market inside the thing saying best teachers apply for this role. This is going to be a revised role, stuff like that. And we reselect through a four-step process new people into these roles. Right? So we actually watch how have you taught your class? How do you look at data? How do you coach? We give you a dummy video and say what advice would you give this teacher? You know, we do this, we give you points and we select the best people into these roles. 
then we conduct induction for people into these roles saying how do you coach because even the best people coaching is a completely i might be a great teacher but coaching another 100 teachers is a completely different game right or facilitating a group of 100 teachers completely different game reading data and providing inputs completely different game so we provide a whole induction and a four year program that we work with these people to help them support teachers right so it may be a bit so if you want quick results in the next 6 months our program is not the right program right because it's going to involve this getting consensus around these are the wrong things mm. that we are doing at the moment mm. let's get the right leaders let's get the right mm. skills in those leaders mm. but then at some point somewhere between 18 and 36 months there's suddenly a shift in the way the district works right and one of the districts where we were working somewhere between 18 and 36 months suddenly for the first time the private school enrollment started going down and the government school enrollment started going up and this is something that has never happened before in the country right and it was actually mentioned in manki baat by the prime minister because it's so unusual like how can government schools be re-enrolling kids but now this as a technique when you just get the best people as leaders now when i'm going in i'm able to give the tools to this cluster resource coordinator to motivate the people in the school to organize teacher groups to learn from each other to reflect properly because i am motivated committed high integrity myself the previous leader was not motivated not committed and low integrity so as a teacher i didn't work right so actually so it's not about 12 million teachers it's about these 150 into 60 districts which is about 90000 people now that might seem like a large number but it's not an enormous number of people right, right. if 10 15 ngos each of us picked up and said okay 10 10 districts each we're going to do and we're going to work with these 1000 people for the next 3 to 5 years i think you can very soon have a very big transformation happening in this i think when we think of working with the government a lot of stereotypes come into mind it'll take very long one will have to bribe the people keep changing there's a lot that makes us fearful of working with the government mm. uh, you have worked only with government schools you know what has been your secret sauce of working with governments yeah so i think that a lot of, you're right a lot of people are afraid of working with government but i think that as a skill is going to be key to anyone scaling in this sector right this is the equivalent of you know when you're running a company saying you know once i become ipo then it's really painful because so many people are going to track me i'll have quarterly reports i'll have to do this that everything that's a reality now you know you want to build a big company you have to go ipo so when i look at the funding patterns i think all the csr and all that is great but ultimately if your solution is not inside government and you're not serving at a scale which is very very large uh you've not done your ipo uh and so first i think is to accept that this is not an option it's a question of the option is when the option is not whether that's the starting point so from our point of view it was like okay let's start it straight away if you have to do it at some point might as well bear the pain now two is that you're right there are complexities in government there's no doubt about the fact that working with them is tough all the stereotypes you said about people changing some people being corrupt all those are true But I think our secret sauce has always been that ultimately it's individuals, right? There is a ultimately even inside government there is someone called Pranav Kothari, right? Who's a human being who wants to serve. This is our starting point. The only thing on which I used to train for the first five years within the organization is one statement, which is that every human being is good and wants to do good, but gets caught in systems and incentives. which make him make poor choices right so it's not it's not that is officer who's bad it's the system that's making him perform badly it's not that individual teacher who's bad it's his union and that context we are not able to i mean you know i would like to be a better a person but there are systems and social structures which cause me to behave in a particular way so when you put on that lens with deep empathy for the individual who's in front of you saying i recognize the structures which are making you make this choice if i was in your position i'd probably make as poor a choice so i still remember a government teacher <laughs> government principal in my first year uh, we were working with about 80 principals and he said aap ye sab cheeze bata rahe hain aap aake mere kursi mein aake baith ke aap karke dikhao right and that really hit me i still remember it 10 years later because that's true he said maine apne samaj ke liye raat din maine kaam ki और फिर अचानक किसी ने मुझे ट्रांसफ़र कर दी मेरे जो रिश्ते थे मेरे जो मेरी जो लगाव थी उस समाज के साथ अचानक किसी ने मुझे ट्रांसफ़र कर दिया 
फिर अगले दिन वापस मैंने दूसरी बार की वापस मेरी ट्रांसफ़र हो गई तो फिर तीसरी बार से मैंने बोला क्या फ़ायदा राइट नाउ योर मीटिंग हिम वेन ही इज़ इन एज फिफ्थ कम्युनिटी एंड सिंग ही डजेंट एंगेज विद पेरेंट्स नाउ इफ यू डोंट अंडरस्टैंड वाई ही इज़ मेड दैट चॉइस टूडे राइट एंड देन यू गो टू द बैक ऑफ इट सिंग एंड देन यू स्टार्ट एस्टेब्लिशिंग सिस्टम सिंग हाउ शुड पीपल बी ट्रांसफर right what are the principles for that transfer how much of it should be voluntary what should be the metrics for those transfers when should a person be transferred out of a community what is the handover process if we don't do that and we just come and tell this guy no you're very bad you don't engage with communities look at me i am morally high ground you know i can go and i engage with communities i am a great ngo you are a bad government he doesn't want to hear that because there's no empathy in that right so most i find that if you come with a moral high ground and with a sense of judgmentality If you came to me with a moral high ground and a sense of judgment, I won't engage with you. So equivalently, if you don't engage with deep empathy to understand and then say, "Okay, I understand where you're coming from, but how do we partner together to change the system so that you can be better and a lot more people can be better?" I think that's the key to this. So every day, we realize uh, we are engaging with. Sorry, every week. we engage with about 10000 we listen to 10000 government teachers right that listening is so critical because we are listening 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 right and that is so critical every month we engage with 150 is officers wow. right so that listening to what are the problems what are the structures what are the solutions is very important because everyone is listening to the child right and everyone says in education you have to focus on the child child centered education but what about government employee focused transformation right listen to the government teacher listen to the cluster resource coordinator listen to the block resource coordinator listen to the diet principal listen to the district education officer why are they making the choices they are making and that is extremely key any transformation starts with the individual a lot of our theory you know we looked across the world for theories on how large scale change happens and everyone talks about sweden and finland and this that everything but when you go into the crux of all these things each of us has our different learnings but one of the authors we really like is a guy called michael fullen who's based out of canada and he says in large systems don't change because policies change doesn't change because incentives change doesn't change because more resources are available large systems change because individuals change their behavior and groups of individuals then start changing behavior and then the system itself has a different behavior right and that is the crux of our theory of change that individuals you know have to start caring about children individuals have to start caring about each other and when that happens and suddenly that becomes the new norm right then we suddenly we are just practicing that being committed towards children is very important suddenly yeah. right so uh, so yeah i mean that's our theory of you know working with government so i still remember there is this government uh, school principal who came in our first batch maybe after about 18 months in our program he came crying uh to our office once and i said abhi you know this is a grown man 45 50 years old i don't think he's cried before at least for not for the last 30 years of his life and he said pehli baar so i said sir kya ho gaya kyun hum aise baat kar rahe hain you know give him a glass of water and then he started talking he said 25 saal mein main jab school jata tha to sab bacche ruke hue the ki bell kab bajegi hum bahar kaise ja sakte hain pehli baar jab bell baja बच्चों ने मुझे बोला सर आप मत जाइए ना हमें थोड़ा और सिखाइए राइट एंड दैट जस्ट चेंज हिज रिलेशनशिप विद चिल्ड्रन बिकॉज ही सेड नाउ दे वॉन्ट मी राइट एंड सो वेन यू ट्रीट हिम हिम एज एन इंडिविजुअल ही ट्रीट्स चिल्ड्रन एज इंडिविजुअल्स एंड रिलेशनशिप्स आर रीबिल्ट ही नोज द नेम ऑफ दीज चिल्ड्रन ही नोज वाई दे आर मेकिंग द पोअ चॉइस एंड ही नोट सिंग तुम गंदे हो ही रेकग्नाइज दैट दैट चाइल्ड इज कमिंग फ्रॉम अ फैमिली विच इज एक्सट्रीमली पुअर एंड कांट अफोर्ड दिस टाइम he can't say tum buddhu ho because he recognizes that in that family there is literally malnutrition because of which potentially this child is underdeveloped right and when you treat him with care he starts treating children with care and then you create a completely different and a more positive vicious cycle right and that's the key to working with government and then that becomes a new norm right because if everyone around me is working in a particular way i also suddenly the 11th person who comes in starts working in the same way what advice would you give other leaders uh, of education and other ngos 
how should they be spending their time? And if you can also share what you know, a day in the life looks like for you, where does your time go, uh, that'd be great to hear. So I don't know whether I'm a great role model on this, but different people I think have different leadership styles. Uh, so I won't seek it as advice. I'm happy to share what I do. Um, so I believe that you need large organizations because the advantage of large organizations is that you can do deep research on the particular things, you can see patterns. And as long as you're not just doing a standard McDonald's type solution everywhere and you're actually customizing the solution, large organizations are actually very effective. But the constraint to large organizations is three in my view, right? Our people model, uh, the product model and the financing model. All these three are constrained in different ways. What do I mean by the people model? Uh, so typically the average NGO for me, if you see, you know, is what I call the seven by seven model. The founder initially starts by recruiting seven employees and saying, let's serve this community, right? And then as she's serving and then, you know, it starts growing. So then you get another layer of people who are managing these seven. So you get seven into seven, 49 people, right? And each of those is managing one project somewhere with seven people type of thing. Right? There's a typical span of control which we learn in management. Now, so you're a 50-person organization. This 50-person organization, an average salary of three to five lakhs, is already costs you know about two, two and a half crores. From CSR, you piece together 25, 25 lakhs from some eight, 10 people, and you've got an organization that is already extremely complex to run because you have seven different projects, uh, 10 different CSR donors, and you're caught in this complexity. I think this is the sweet spot at which most NGOs in India are stuck. Breaking out of this was difficult even for us. And breaking out of this really requires you to then go to the next level saying, I'll now have seven leaders like me who will handle seven project seats. That's the only way you can handle 50 projects now, right? There's no other way to do it. And the leaders are not available who can be at this level because this is effectively like if you want to hire at that third level of seven into seven into seven, that leader is effectively like an NGO head. So that person is not available in the market because that person is now handling government relations, is now handling fundraising, is handling all the people issues. She's like a person by herself. This is the equivalent of in a, a partner in a professional services firm, right? The partner really has her own clients, her own staff, her own whatever she needs to do to deliver. And it's just the larger name of a KPMG or whatever is just a very loose um, way to hold all the partners together. So I think if we don't create that next cadre, uh, what I what in our organization is called the program director cadre, we will fail to scale organizations. Um, and that's the key. So I spend a lot of my time on developing the HR and the talent systems within the organization. Um, I mean, like we're an unusual organization this year, we're going to spend 27% less money than we raised. And that's because we just can't find the people, right? So we actually have more money than we're raising because we're just not able to find the talent that's required. You have a high standard on the talent that's required to deliver solutions like this. Commitment levels, integrity levels, value levels, and skill levels of this. So a lot of my time goes in building this people model, uh, building the people in the organization. The second big chunk is on product, right? You need to figure out the program or product or whatever you want to call it. How do you develop a product that's actually in leadership, for example? I'll give you two extremes. One is, you know, there's a school with 15 children um, in Jharkhand, in a village in Jharkhand with extreme poverty. And there's a school with 2,500 children in Bombay. Ah, now the leadership needs of these two are completely different, but your program still has to be functional. So how do you develop uh, a solution that's applicable in both contexts, that's customizable to different contexts? I think this is another uh, big, big element. And of course, the third one is the funding side. How do you develop financing models which can also scale. Right. So these are the three big things on which I line up spending my time. Great. Thank you so much, Aditya. It was a very enriching conversation on how does one scale, work with the government, and all this while keeping the human at the center of it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank really you. appreciate your time. Thank you so much.